nice fish. This is a nice fish. Look at that. What a magnificent specimen. Look at that belly. I feel the strength, his gills are working well. Off it goes. Welcome everyone to the new Fly Fisher. I'm your host, Phil Rowley. It's often been said that big fish eat little fish, and this is especially true during the fall months on many productive western still waters. Today, it's all about forage fish, rods, lines, presentation tactics, the predator-prey relationship, everything you need to know to be successful fly fishing using bait fish patterns in the fall. Sit back, enjoy, we're gonna show you some really spectacular fish. Live another day. Away he goes. Great fish. Wow. Oh, baby. Look at that fish. Stop. Wiggle. On the way down. Although capable of inhabiting almost any region of a lake, forage fish in productive still waters find haven in the shallows. Here along the margins, forage fish such as brook stickleback and fathead minnows seldom stray from the relative security of shoreline structure such as cattails, bulrush, shallow weed beds and beaver lodges. Trout are not the only predators to be on the watch for. Birds such as grebes are another forage fish clue. Grebes prey on small fish, indicating forage fish are available. When targeting stillwater trout using forage patterns, watch for trout herding bait fish into these areas and explore them thoroughly. When using forage fish patterns on lakes, you want to target key structure that are going to hold and attract minnows. And tules, cattails like we have in the foreground here, are excellent places to prospect. Brown trout in particular love to cruise along the face or actually go in and amongst the cattails, herd up the minnows, ball them up and slash through them. You can often see it right before your eyes. It's very exciting. This is where you want to hang something under an indicator very close to the edge of the tules and hopefully you can lure one out. One of the things you need to look for is visible structure. And to my right, we have one of the best sources of structure when we're chasing trout using minnow patterns is a beaver lodge. And there's a fish right there has just moved. Just off the bow. And there he is. We got him. He's taken the point fly, the grizzly muddler, and it's a nice rainbow. And this is good. He's going out into the deeper water, which is great to us, away from things he can tangle. So we're just going to try and keep him away from the boat. There he is, he's showing his side, he's tired and nettable. Put the net in the water. It's the beauty of wooden nets, you can just put the net in the water, get a good grip on the fish, and there you go. That's the value of targeting key structure, beaver lodges, cattails, bulrushes, weed beds, prime forage fish habitat. That's where the predator is going to be looking for his prey. In this case, a nice, plump, healthy rainbow. Off he goes. Just setting up with a bit of an angle. I've got using the wind to my advantage. There's a good fish in here. He's chasing minnows around. Behavior you want to look for is you'll see little dimples. That's a sign of a school of minnows. And all of a sudden, the water gets nervous and that's a clump of minnows, let's say 500 is now in a space designed for 200 and they get nervous, the trout's hurting them and then he just goes in like a bull in a china shop, rakes through them, snaps up as many as he can and then he'll disappear off and do this again and again. It's a patience game but if you can hook them, it's an awful lot of fun. We're in shallow water, that fish is in barely a foot of water chasing these minnows around so we've got a spooky fish that could be anywhere. We've got snags along the bottom. It's going to be a challenge, but I'm going to give it a cast because it's too good to pass up an opportunity. 
I'm using a mids tip with a little flashback up top and a minnow with a foam underbody. I'm just basically trying to keep my flies up and moving and hopefully he'll see them and chase them around. But he's been moving the entire length of this weed bed. He'll herd those minnows up, push them together, and then just vicious pushes and swirls right through them. There he goes. We finally closed the deal. We have been working on this fish for probably close to an hour. I've got the midge tip on. He's way out to sea now. He's into my backing. This fish is excited because he's got nowhere to go. And he just came up and ate the fly. He's been cruising in and out. Theorized that he would come in, herd some minnows, move out of the shallow water for his own protection, come back in, do a little more ravaging of the herd, if you will. Oh, pulled him out. But that's the way it goes. But that was exciting. We closed the deal. Patience, patience, patience. It's a lot of fun. Oh, man. I'm going to go try that again. We're going to search another spot. Maybe we can find another roller like that. Trout often herd and chase minnows in the shallows using the edges of the weeds and the water's surface to corral their prey. As the trout moves in, the minnows instinctively form a tight confined school. Due to the shallow water, the minnows cluster just below the now riffled surface, a term often referred to as nervous water. When a trout attacks, the school breaks up into small, easy to attack clusters. Terrified, the minnows scatter, often clearing the water in their attempts to flee. The school now fractured, trout target individual or small groups of minnows aggressively pursuing them at or just below the surface. Aggressive marauding trout create distinct swirls and bow waves in their attempt to snatch a minnow or two. After the attack is complete a sense of calm returns until the trout feeds again. Today I'll be using two leader setups. For our slow sinking lines such as the midge tip, hover and clear intermediate, I'll be using a standard 9 foot leader tapered to 2x. Using a triple surgeon's knot I then add 2 to 3 feet of 2x or 3x fluorocarbon to complete the leader. For my floating indicator line I'll be using a 10 foot indicator leader and a quick release indicator. With the indicator on the leader, attach a small number 12 to 14 barrel swivel to the end of the leader using an improved clinch knot. I then attach two feet of 2x fluorocarbon leader to the swivel, once again using an improved clinch knot to complete the leader. No matter the leader setup, the fly is always attached using a non-slip loop knot, especially on balanced flies. On both of my leader systems, I'll be using a sliding dropper. To form a sliding dropper, form a perfection loop at one end of an 8 inch length of fluorocarbon tippet. Lay the prepared tippet length under the leader above the swivel or surgeon's knot. Pass the tag end of the tippet through the perfection loop and pull tight to lock in place. So we're just going to start out, or we're working close to the toolies at this time of the year in the fall. These fish come in tight right against these uh, long stem bulrushes, cattails. That's where the minnows are living. That's where they're going to hunt. So strike indicator presentation is your best option because you can suspend flies anywhere from 18 inches to three feet down. And what we're going to do is I'm putting on a pattern of mine I call the olive pumpkin. It's balanced so it will hang horizontally in the manner in which natural bait fish and other food sources such as leeches go. It has an olive coloration, a little bit of an orange hot spot that is also common to um, fathead minnows when the males are all um, in their spawning regalia. And above that, we're gonna put one of my favorite um, small minnow patterns, and that's a flashback set pheasant tail. Many of these minnows are very small at this time of year. We nickname them pin fry. They have a little hint of flash and a predominantly brown or brown olive body, and the flashback pheasant tail does an excellent job of that. So we're gonna hang these within a foot of the weeds and slowly creep them back and see if we can intercept a cruising rainbow. Low light conditions are excellent times 
to probe the area, prospect with bait fish patterns. And this is because trout have rods and cones, same as we do for color and contrast. Bait fish, many bait fish species have the same characteristics. When the light changes, such as dawn, evening, big massive cloud cover comes in, there's a period of transition when they don't see very well. And trout as predators make this transition faster, therefore they have a predatory advantage at those times over the bait fish and this is when they really turn on and start feeding on them. So low light conditions, overcast days, morning, evening, these are times you want to try using bait fish patterns on these lakes that we're fishing today in Western Canada or your local waters. Got a nice rainbow on here and I'm, the line I'm using is a midge tip and we're fishing cast and retrieve techniques using forage fish patterns. You want to use slow sinking lines because we're fishing shallow water. So midge tip, a hover line that sinks at about one inch per second or a clear intermediate. This is a nice rainbow. I saw the rise, put the flies in the general vicinity, slow hand twist, and the line just zips out of my fingers. So he's a good fish. We should always, without losing focus on the fish, gather the line so if he runs suddenly, I'm not accidentally standing on the line and risking a break off. So I'm just using my pinky finger as a guide. Now the fish is on the reel if he bolts and typically right at the boat is where he'll make his last stand, if you will. And I can see a little squirrel zonker pattern I think he's taken. The upper fly, I've got a two fly system using this cast and retrieve. I keep them about three to five feet apart. This fish, as you can see by, as evidenced by the clump of weeds, ran us into the weeds and we've been able to coax them out. But the challenge is I've got this massive clump on my fly line, which is making it rather interesting. And there he is. <laughs> A unique way to fight and land fish, but we've got him. I'm just going to put the net in the water because it floats. I can handle the fish. He's got a little few weeds on him in beautiful shape. So he's in the shallows here, cruising around stocking up for winter on a healthy diet of minnows, fatheads, and brook sticklebacks, and there he goes. So again, the three lines I like to use are the midge tip, the hover, and the clear intermediate. And the choice depends on water depth and how fast you're moving the fly. The faster you move the fly, the quicker the sink rate you can use because the sink rate of the line won't overpower your presentation. So casting and retrieving using minnow patterns is an excellent choice uh, for presentation in the shallows. The midge tip is a floating line married to a 39 inch section of clear intermediate line. The intermediate tip sinks slowly, making it an ideal choice for presenting flies in shallow water less than 10 feet in depth. Vary the sink rate and retrieve speeds to explore the water until you catch fish. The midge tip is an excellent line choice when prospecting shallow water. Just move to another spot and again using these indicator techniques. What's interesting to note about this spot is we've got the wind is directly at my back. So we've got wave action pushing prey, in this case fathead minnows, in against the weeds. I'm going to try and keep them out of there. And of course where there's prey there are predators and we're three feet down right now. Looking at where he's positioned on the leader, I believe he ate the flashback pheasant tail. Again, an excellent pattern to suggest small fry, small minnows that you're seeing a lot of around right now. She seems to be tiring now. And he's a healthy, healthy fish. Get our net ready. We're looking for him to show his sides. See how he's starting to tire, the sides are showing. You don't want to horse him in, risk pulling the 
We're using 2X tippet here, 2X fluorocarbon, but we don't want to horse them and risk pulling that fly out. Oh, there we go. That is a good size rainbow. <laughs> Look at that. That's 26 inches of fat, nickel bright rainbow. And this is why strike indicators are such an excellent presentation choice when using minnow patterns, because you can keep your fly in the zone, use the wind to surgically work the structure and keep your fly where the fish are cruising. Beautiful fish. I want to make sure it gave a great account of itself. Just going to let it swim out. There it goes. Swimming off. <laughs> Again, strike indicators, tight to the toolies, tight to structure. Your fly's in the zone the entire time. It's probably the most effective way to fish minnows in really shallow water, such as we have here in the fall. A floating line coupled with a strike indicator is a deadly combination when fish are focused on bait fish in shallow, weedy areas. Set your indicator depth so the point fly suspends just above the weed tops. Let the fly sit still or retrieve slowly as fishing conditions dictate. A wind rippled surface is often the only movement needed to impart action to suspended flies. And I'm using a, a cast, probably familiar to most river and stream fishermen, a reach cast to reach the fly up into the wind, which is off to my left, and then allowing the fly to swing on a straight line all the way through, and when it gets straight down below me, I'm going to start moving the fly back towards me. These fish are chasing forage fish. They're used to seeing movement in their prey. This is not an indicator presentation that's associated with perhaps coronamids, a slower moving prey. So you want to keep that fly moving either by the wind or a slow hand twist or even the odd little strip just to make that fly pitch and undulate and act like a wounded or frightened minnow and attract that predator and we can get the fish we've been looking for. Using forage fish patterns, you want to use slow sinking lines because we're fishing shallow water. So midge tip, a hover line that sinks at about one inch per second, or a clear intermediate. We want to keep our flies up in the water column because as a predator, trout love to come up from below and ambush their prey. They use the surface as, as an edge to herd the fish against. And this one is a midge tip, but a hover. Clear intermediate are also excellent choices. And generally a little bit deeper, you would use a line like a clear intermediate, or if the fish are active, meaning they'll chase the fly, you can use a more aggressive retrieve. If you're using a slower retrieve, then a slower sinking line would be a better choice so that the sink rate of the line doesn't work against you, causing your flies to sink too deep and hang up or you know get below the level of the fish. Hover and clear intermediate lines are excellent forage fish lines. The hover sinks at a paltry one inch per second. The clear intermediate sinks at a rate of one and a half to two inches per second. These lines provide an exceptional horizontal presentation and work well in windy conditions. Line choice, whether hover or intermediate, is a function of water depth and retrieve speed. When fish are active, you can use a quicker retrieve. In these situations, the faster sinking clear intermediate is often the best choice. There are a number of retrieve options when imitating forage fish. The hand twist provides an erratic choppy action suggesting a minnow darting and pausing as it moves through the water. Short strips can be used to suggest a lazy cruising minnow. Increase the strip tempo to represent a scared darting minnow. Long slow pulls coupled with pauses are another retrieve option. As with all retrieves, the length of the pause is important. A number of retrieves can be blended together to determine which retrieve option the fish prefer. Varied erratic retrieves often work best. This fish took right close to the toolies. It's totally swung around out to deep water, which is hopefully to my advantage so it can't run into those toolies and uh, break me off. But 
I'm not totally in a position of control here right now because the fish is full of energy. Moved up to the front of the boat here just to keep the fish away from anchors and motors and things like that. And again, we were just, this fly was four feet down. We were in seven feet of water, swinging the flies. We had a nice breeze here that moves the flies along the face of the tulies. And then the fly swings down from below and I retrieve the fly up. There we go. What a great looking fish. Man, these fish are big, fat and bright. They're not terribly long, but they are fat. What a magnificent fish. Beautiful. Fat on forage. What a gorgeous fish. There it goes off into the deep. Wow. Well, I hope you've enjoyed today's show. It's been an incredible experience catching these trophy fish using forage fish patterns. For more information on this show and other shows in our series, don't forget to visit us on the web at thenewflyfisher.com. And don't forget to like us on Facebook. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in another beautiful place next time. Hi, I'm Tom Rosenbauer. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you like this and you want to see more, subscribe and you can get all our weekly uploads. Our locations, contests, news, and much more. Come visit and like us on Facebook.